Before the video starts, just a quick reminder to go check out The Chilling App. If you can't get enough content from me here on this channel, myself and other narrators here on YouTube are providing hours of unique and spine-tingling scary story narrations exclusively over on Chilling. There's new narrations for me added weekly, and there's new professional narrators constantly being added to the list. There's literally hundreds of hours of scary stories to binge on, from monsters, paranormal, thrillers, and true scary stories. The Chilling app even has classic novels, true crime stories, and chilling original series. And this all can be enjoyed with their one-of-a-kind ambient menu, where you can mix in immersive and relaxing sound effects like a crackling fire, dark storms, and chill rain and adjust their volumes independently in a sleep timer so you can drift off to dreamland without interruptions after. And guess what? They just added the ability to download stories you're listening to, so you can listen offline now as well. Click the link in the description or the pinned comment to try the free trial of the Chilling app, and after that it's only $2.99 a month, which makes it completely ad and interruption free. And don't forget, Chilling is giving away a PlayStation 5 bundle. There's another link down below with simple instructions on how to enter. A winner will be announced February 28th, 2022. Thanks so much, friends, and enjoy the stories. This happened one summer when I was a kid. Me and my little brother and sister were staying at our aunt's house in another part of the city. At the time, we used to sleep in the same room as our parents, but since our aunt and uncle's place was much bigger, we were able to sleep on the sofas in the lounge while having movie marathons every night. One night, we fell asleep watching one of the Scooby-Doo movies, but then a few hours later, I woke up to hear a sound coming from our main gate. When I looked towards the source of the sound, I saw a guy standing inside the house near the door. I could just about make out the shape of the guy, but I couldn't see his face. So my first thoughts were like, what is dad doing out there so late? My father used to lock the doors at night before he went to bed, so it kind of made sense that that's what he was doing. But then I saw something that made my entire body tense up from fear. Whoever it was had some kind of rifle or shotgun in their hands. This guy probably heard me moving around, and I don't think he could see me because he just stopped there, totally still as a statue. I think I was in just total denial, and just couldn't accept that there was an armed home invader in our place, because I just called out, Dad? Just in case it was him. I don't think the guy was expecting kids in the house because... He just turned around and got out of there as soon as he heard me. But then the fact that he didn't answer to my dad, please, only confirmed that there was a strange man in our house. That prompted a massive freak out from both me and my brother, which then alerted our relatives. Within the hour, the cops were over and me, my brother, and my sister all just got to eat ice cream at like 3am after we gave statements to the police. Kind of funny, but... Years later, my little sister asked if the guy was Santa Claus, because he showed up in the middle of the night and then we all suddenly got a treat. Typical cuteness from my baby sister and it definitely helped me get over the whole thing. But that whole thing definitely amounts to one of the scarier events of my childhood. My story is not one where I was the target of someone's stalking or harassment, but one where I was the guy who was at the right place at the right time, and I'm fairly certain my inadvertent intervention may have saved someone I'd never met from, well, who knows what. This was back in 2015 or 2016. I'm a career tow truck driver. At this point, I've been towing cars for most of my adult life and will likely do so until I either retire or die whichever comes first. At the time, I was working for a small towing company with only two employees, and we rotated who was on call each weekend. It was my weekend on call, and it was summer, so with people being out and about late and whatnot, I was pretty busy. Cleaning up accidents, 
towing broken down cars both in the city and off the highway. I was fine with it as I was paid commission at the time, so the more calls I did, the more money I made. So it's a Saturday night, now Sunday morning, and it's around 2.30 to 3 in the morning, and like I said, I've been busy. I'm tired, a little grumpy, and kind of want to go home when my phone rings. It's an insurance company calling asking if we can do a tow for one of their customers who had broken down on the side of the highway. The breakdown location they give me is about 15 miles out of town, which I normally wouldn't do, but the tow destination happens to be a dealership that's just a couple of minutes from my apartment. I contemplate rejecting the call, but because I'm paid commission, I figured, screw it. I can run up and grab this car, drop it off around the corner from my place, then hopefully I can head home and get a couple of hours of shut-eye. So I take the call and hop on the highway. The insurance company provided me with the customer's first name, which we'll just say is Kara, and gave me a phone number for her. Usually I try to make contact with the people who are on the side of the highway to let them know I'm on the way and give them an ETA. I try calling her a couple of times, but she doesn't answer. Not unusual. After a short while, I see hazard lights up the way on the shoulder, so I turn on my strobes and start slowing down. As I approach, I notice that not only is there the late model car that I'm looking for, but there's another car on scene as well that doesn't have its hazards on, but it's parked in front of the car I'm meant to tow. This is annoying, but not uncommon, as I need to be able to get in front of the disabled car in order to load it, and sometimes people don't realize that. But because the other car is there, I instead pull up behind both cars. You do this so that, as the tow driver, you're the one that has to make the weird maneuver of pulling off the shoulder and back onto the shoulder, and that the other cars just have to drive straight forward on the shoulder. Otherwise, if I pulled out front, then the other car would have to go around me, and it's unprofessional and unsafe to make them do that. Standing at the trunk of the late model car, which is now directly in front of me, are a man and a woman. The woman is probably in her early 20s and dressed to the nines for a night out. She's about 5'1", five, 5'2". Five, She's wearing tight leatherish or something pants, a halter top, long black hair, very pretty individual. The man is probably around 5'10", skinny, maybe 150 to 160, wearing a dark hoodie and dirty jeans. They're standing very close, facing each other. She has her arms crossed and he's leaning down talking to her. I stepped out of my truck and approached them both, introducing myself. They separate a few times and I look to the woman and say, Are you Kara? She nods. I say I'm here from her insurance company and ask what's going on with the car. Immediately the man pipes up and says, Yeah, it's just having some fuel issues. It's an easy fix. Can you just drop it off at this commuter parking lot? I'm going to fix it for her there. I'm rather annoyed at this because the commuter lot in question is further up the highway and I'm already 15 miles out of town. Like I said before, I only took this call because it was supposed to be coming back toward my apartment and I really wanted to go home. Not only that, but in order to change the original tow destination, I would have to call the insurance company back, wait on hold for who knows how long for a representative, then let them know of the change and try to get them to pay me extra for the deadhead miles back home after unloading. And I really didn't want to do any of this. And thirdly, this is a late model car. I'm no mechanic, but it's not enough that whatever is wrong with it is likely covered under warranty, so the dealership is really the best place for it to go anyways. I explain this all to the guy, but he's not really having it. He gets stern with me, saying something like, Look man, you just need to take the car while I tell you to take it. We go back and forth on this for maybe 60 seconds, and he's just getting angrier. Well, you know what man, you're not the named insured. Kara is. The easy way to settle this is to ask what she wants to do with the car and whatever she says is what I'll do. Fingers crossed, she'll want me to take it to the dealership so I can get home sooner. I turn to look at Kara to ask her that question and I don't see her right away. She's no longer standing where she was just a minute ago which was slightly off to my right. I continue to not see her until I turned almost all the way around because she's standing directly behind me. And by directly, I mean within an inch of my back, arms still crossed. I look down at her and 
she locks eyes with me. Her eyes are as wide as plates, almost like an owl, and immediately it feels like she's staring into my soul. She didn't say a word, and she didn't have to. I took a step back and did what felt like a double-double take. I looked at him, then at her, then at him again, then back at her, and it slowly started to dawn on me that maybe something isn't right. I asked her, do you know this guy? And she ever so slightly shook her head no. The expression on her face when I asked her that will forever be burned into my skull. I turned to the guy and was like, oh, you gotta go, man. Now, I'm not a tough guy. I'm not a total beta male if there is such a thing and I don't care who knows it. I have nothing to prove. I'm super adverse to confrontation and will run at the first sign of trouble. And I'm not exactly the biggest of guys either. I am, however, what I like to call sturdy. I'm 5'8 and 240 pounds. I got a bit of a gut and I also have big thighs and broad shoulders and people are generally surprised to find out that I weigh as much as I do and I think that might have been my saving grace for what happened next. Without a word, the guy starts moving to Kara, and I move to stay in between them. He tries to push me out of his way by shoving me in the chest, but because I believe he underestimated my weight, only pushes me hard enough to make me take a single step back. Immediately, I took that step forward towards him and body check him, hard, as hard as I could, hard enough to completely knock him over basically onto his butt. Because we rotated during the back and forth push bit, Kara is now in front of me to my right, somewhat between me and the guy who's trying to scramble to his feet. I reached out and snatched the poor girl up by her waist, spun her towards my truck and yelled for her to get into the driver's side, and she does so. I turn back to the guy, who's standing up again at this point and he's breathing hard. He gets right up in my face but doesn't do anything, just breathes at me. I stare him right in the face and mustering up the best dad voice I can muster just say, you need to go. I'm shaking now and I'm absolutely terrified. I don't know if he has a weapon, I don't know if he's going to try to fight me, and I don't know what I would do if he did. Like I said, I'm not a tough guy. I don't know how to fight. I've never been in a fight in my life. What if I get hurt badly? What if I get stabbed? What do I even do now? I just want to go home for God's sake. I wasn't even going to take this stupid call. All this is running through my head at lightning speed. After probably around 15 seconds or so, which felt like eons, he kind of huffs a bit, smiles one of the creepiest smiles I've ever seen, and starts to back off. Sucking his teeth and rubbing his hands together, he slowly walks backwards a few steps, then makes his way to the front car, gets in, and drives off. I stayed motionless watching him until I could no longer see his taillights. I got Kara's car loaded up on the tow truck and as we made our way to the dealership she told me through tears that her car had shut off while she was driving and she pulled onto the shoulder and called her parents because she was on their insurance. Her parents made the call to the insurance company who eventually dispatched me to her location. While she was waiting, a bit after she made the call, the guy pulled up in front of her and walked up to her passenger side window to try to talk to her, asking if she needed help, etc., and she told him she was fine, that a tow truck was coming, and she didn't need any help. He persisted, and she tried to tell him off, and eventually tried to roll up the window. Apparently, he stuck his arm in the window and got the door unlocked, and opened the door. In fear, she jumped out of the car, leaving her phone inside, and ran to the back of her car and stayed put there because it was in line of sight of traffic. Apparently he was pretty lewd with her, and whenever she tried to go back to the car, he would prevent her from getting in. Several minutes later I showed up, and who knows what would have happened had the timing been any different. Her parents were waiting at the dealership when we arrived, and she told them what had just happened. Her parents gave me a $20 tip, which was all the cash they had on them at the time, and Kara gave me a very tight and clearly heartfelt hug before I left. I never saw her again. I'll tell you what, every guy has daydreamed at some point of coming to the rescue of a pretty girl in trouble, myself included. You think you're going to be a hero, that you're going to be the 
bee's knees, you're gonna slay the dragon and get the girl and ride off into the sunset like the king you are. But for me, being in that situation, in the moment, was one of the most terrible feelings I've ever had in my life. Forced into a confrontation I didn't want nor was prepared for, not knowing what to expect from a clearly not well-hinged individual, I didn't feel like the bee's knees, and I didn't feel like a hero. I felt like a scared little kid encountering a bully on the playground for the first time. If I'm ever in a situation like that, I will never not intervene. I just really hope I don't have to. This happened my senior year of college when I lived off campus. I had two roommates in my apartment, a townhouse thing named Natalie and Katie. Katie was out that night doing homework in one of the school buildings and, and I was awoken at 3am when I heard some knocking at the door downstairs. I thought that was weird considering the hour but I figured somebody had the wrong place and would realize and leave. The knocking didn't stop though and I lied in bed for a good several minutes thinking yeah they'll go away, they'll go away, they'll get bored. As one might expect though, I started to grow confused and then kind of freaked out by this person's persistence. Then the knocking turned into banging and I couldn't ignore it anymore. Honestly, I probably should have called the police instantly, but it was the middle of the night and I was just confused. So I headed to the top of the stairs to see Natalie standing near the door, staring at it. Her room was on the bottom floor, so she had just walked up to it. We exchanged a baffled look because... What the heck, it's 3am, this is weird. Natalie called out and asked them who they were and what they wanted. We're friends of Katie's, said the voice on the other end, who sounded male and about our age. We know her boyfriend, and we heard she was feeling down, so we came to surprise her. That was already a weird story because, again, 3 in the morning. But thankfully Katie wasn't even home, so we both informed them of this. Katie's not here, she's off doing something else. Good, they're going to leave, right? They came here to see Katie, she's not here. They'll leave us alone and we can go back to sleep. Just open the door! I know, I know. If I hadn't called the police before, I definitely should have done it now. It was weird though. That night I realized why people do stupid stuff in horror movies. Not only had I been woken up out of nowhere... But it feels surreal to be in a situation like this, like there's no way you could actually be in danger. That only happens in horror movies and true crime documentaries, and in questionable creepy stories online. It would never happen to me. I'm just a random, ordinary, boring person going about my business. I don't need to call the police. I'm sure this will get cleared up and everything will be fine, I thought. So yeah... Natalie and I did this stupid thing and tried to argue with them. We told them that again, Katie wasn't here. And there was no need for them to stay. Eventually, Natalie asked what their names were. Throughout the encounter, we made out two distinct voices, but only one gave us a name. And I texted Katie without telling him, asking if she was friends with someone with that name. After a couple of minutes, during which we were still arguing with the stranger, Katie replied, I am, but I don't think she knows where I live. That wasn't good. But even worse, she? The person on the other door had a male voice, so this was a real name but not the real person. Whoever this was knew stuff about Katie, like who she hung out with. I told Katie to stay where she was and not to come back until we were told everything was okay. Finally, we told the guys that if they didn't leave, we were going to call the police. No, 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 no. Don't call the police. Don't call the police, okay? If we wanted to do something bad, we would have already done it, right? Yeah. That last bit wasn't helping their case. Just open the door, okay? The attempts at reasoning with them basically devolved into them telling us, just open the door, just open the door, over and over again, until we finally actually did call the police. We hid in Natalie's room and dialed 911 and explained what was going on. Thankfully, there was a police station close by, so it wouldn't take long for them to arrive. 
Unfortunately, I made the mistake of heading back into the living room and yelling through the door that called the cops. But contrary to what you might think, that actually didn't seem to scare them at all. They seemed only mildly upset and kept arguing. To this day, I can only assume they just didn't believe us or something. And then we heard a neighboring home's door swing open and a very angry man's voice. If you don't leave right now, I'm calling the police. For whatever reason, that was what caused them to freak out, and they drove off. The police arrived and we told them the whole story. Natalie revealed that a couple of times she had just barely peeked through the blinds of a window close to the front door, and she noted that there were two guys, but only one of them was ever at the door at any given time. They would switch, with one at the door and the other sitting in the driver's seat of a car parked out front, presumably for getaway purposes. So, yeah, that's reassuring. They also hadn't looked drunk, according to Natalie, and they definitely hadn't sounded like they were drunk. There wasn't much the police could do besides sweep the area a bit, but they told us that if the strangers showed up again, to immediately call instead of engaging with them at all. One of the officers did give us some self-defense tactics and told us what kinds of household items and chemicals would work best for self-defense. After making sure everything was okay and reassuring us, they left and we eventually called Katie and told her the weirdos were gone. She arrived home and was understandably a bit shaken herself. We sat down and asked her who might have known where she lived. She did know people who had come to the apartment, so some people certainly, but Natalie hadn't recognized the guys outside as any previous visitors. Worse, it turned out that not only did they know Katie's friend's name, but they claimed to know her boyfriend even though he didn't even live in the state where we were going to school. She swore up and down she didn't know anyone who would want to hurt her. By this point, it was around 5am so I didn't even bother going to sleep since I was going to a workshop that morning. I told a lot of my classmates the story and it freaked them out too, and the entire day Natalie and I jumped at every unexpected noise, every shadow, every random movement, and that night it was hard to sleep. I expected to hear knocking at the door at any second. Thankfully, they didn't come back, ever, but that almost makes things more unsettling in a way. I'll never ever know what they wanted that night. Did they think we were hiding Katie? Was she seeing less than savory people in secret? Did they want to hurt her? If they did, why did they never give up and go looking for her elsewhere? Was all of that just an excuse to get into an apartment of young women? Did they want to kidnap us, hurt us, rob us? Who knows? I try not to let it bother me, but I wish I knew if my life was in danger that night. I have a feeling it might have been. After all, they weren't wearing face coverings, so if they wanted to commit a violent crime, they might want to get rid of the witnesses. My boyfriend, our husky, and I embarked upon our long holiday road trip to see our families earlier today. 14 hours of this trip takes place on a major US interstate highway. We were looking for places to make our last gas stop and found a place just off the highway. We pulled off and into the desolate gas station and immediately were greeted by a fairly large, somewhat sketchy man taking not so subtle glances in our direction. We both were joking that maybe we chose the wrong gas station and boy did we. My boyfriend suggested that while he pumped the gas and run to the restroom, I take our dog and let him stretch his legs. Being a city girl, I know to always carry my mace and phone, especially at night. We diverge as I started to make my way towards the little lit side of the gas station and my boyfriend to the restroom. I made it not 30 feet from my car and was approached by a small chihuahua mix and I had a collar on, who happily greeted our husky. We looked around for an owner while the two dogs got to know one another and continued to walk to a patch of grass with our new follower in tow. My first instinct was to help the dog and find his owner, but in the back of my mind, something felt very off, and to be honest, it felt off since the moment we pulled in. I immediately called my boyfriend and told him I had found a dog and said, 
Hey, I found a dog, but something weird. He immediately abandoned his bathroom break and came out to meet me. While I'm standing with our dog and this dog who came seemingly out of nowhere, I felt eyes on me from the employees working outside. My boyfriend expressed concern about the dog being loose so close to a major highway and further looked around for his possible owner. He approached one of the employees who was changing out trash liners right next to our car for some time now, and he asked the employee if he had any idea whose dog this was. And in perfect English, he replied, I don't speak English, and anxiously turned around to only continue to go through the motions of changing out a trash liner he had been standing at this whole time. He then continued to watch us chase around this dog until the dog led us behind the convenience store gas station. With my boyfriend five feet behind me, I followed the dog to the back of the store. Behind the store, ten or so big rig trucks sat largely in darkness resting for the night. Cardboard boxes and broken wood pallets covered the dirt. A large man in a gas station uniform greeted me staring through a glass door. With my boyfriend out of view, I bent down to check the dog's tags as the man continued to stare. My boyfriend approached and that's when the man behind the glass door's demeanor changed. Almost dejectedly, he opened the glass door and I quickly asked, Do you know whose dog this is? Nervously, he fumbled his words and replied, Yeah, uh, uh, yeah, that's, that's, um, that's my dog. We both exhaled and exchanged a look as if to say, something about this is really weird. We made our way back to the car and my boyfriend remembered he had to still use the bathroom, so I settled back into our locked car. When my boyfriend got back to the car, he told me the same man we talked to at the back of the store followed him to the bathroom and stood behind him watching. That's when we realized just how creepy and surreal the last 15 minutes had been. As we drove away, we discussed the strange and creepy series of events. How the whole thing felt staged or set up. Why did the employees act like he didn't know the dog when it belonged to his coworker? We immediately googled the small town we had stopped in and discovered it had been a hot spot for human trafficking and in recent months, 60 people were arrested. Was this just a string of eerie coincidences, or was there something more sinister going on? My brothers, partner, best friend, and I all recently took a trip to Kansas City to go to the Orville Peck concert. We waited until sort of last minute to reserve an Airbnb because we weren't 100% sure who all was going. Nonetheless, we found one just outside of KC in a suburban area called Grandview at a pretty reasonable rate. The host's overall rating was good and we didn't see anything out of the ordinary when reading the first few reviews so we thought we had gotten a pretty good deal. We arrived in Grandview at a little after 3pm. Our Airbnb was the bottom floor of the owner's home, and as we pulled up to the house, we noticed quite a bit of religious signs and statues on the lawn. Now, don't get me wrong, I don't have an issue with people believing in what they believe in so long as it doesn't infringe upon other people's rights, but here we were, a group of very visibly queer folk about to attend a gay country concert, blindly walking into someone's home that we'd be staying in for the next two nights. We decided there was nothing to be worried about and that, after all, we technically were in the Bible Belt so we shouldn't be surprised that we were staying in the home of someone who was religious. My brother and partner called the hosts and met her at the door of our guest suite. She showed them around while the rest of us got our suitcases unloaded. When they came back to meet us, they said that she was super nice and again our minds were eased. We decided to hang out order food, and rest a little before we headed off to the concert that night. Our comfort did not last long, though. While we were getting our suitcases unpacked and laying around in one of the bedrooms of our guest suite, my youngest brother was casually looking through the drawers and dressers and side tables, as anyone would do, you know. Most of what he found was normal. Extra bed sheets, pens, paper tablets, nothing really out of the ordinary. That is until we came across something that would completely change our outlook on the trip. 
Inside the drawer was a Bible. Not super weird considering where we were staying, but as he was flipping through the pages of it, a small tinfoil packet fell out. Now, for those of you that don't know anything about drugs or what they look like, what fell out of that Bible rhymes with smack star Sarawin. That's right. Not even 30 minutes into our stay, my youngest brother found hard drugs in the folds of a Bible. At this point, we weren't sure what to do. We didn't want to tell the hosts, and we most certainly did not want to call the cops. We contemplated taking the packet and throwing it away at some random gas station, but ultimately we decided to put it back where we found it and act like none of us had seen it. We got food and started getting ready for the concert. While the rest of us got ready, my partner, who was not going to the concert, started reading through the household handbook. Everything seemed pretty standard except a few lines that read something like, We will respect your privacy so long as you respect ours. We can be as available as you need us to be. And if you are interested in speaking about the ministries of God, feel free to reach out. Again, I have nothing against people following the religions that they do, but... That seemed like an awfully out-of-place thing to put in your house rules handbook for your guest suite. There were a few other books around the guest suite that stuck out as a little off-base with titles like Teaching Men to Comprehend How Women Think and How Women Should Think. We ignored these things for the most part, aside from my partner who was now freaked out about being left alone at the suite while the rest of us went off to our concert. I just told him it was some Bible-thumping BS and that he really didn't have anything to worry about. He's a worrywart though, so as soon as we left, he locked himself in the bedroom and started looking a little more into the books that we found. He came to the realization that the books were associated with a group called IHOPKC, or International House of Prayer, a prominent religious cult founded in Kansas City a majority of whose members live in the Grandview suburb where we were staying. I could write a whole separate post about the beliefs of the International House of Prayer members, but essentially they're an evangelical Christian group that has a functioning 24-7 prayer room that's been going non-stop since 1999. There's also a murder, ruled someone taking their own life slash cover-up case associated with the group, but again, it's all too much to go over here. We got back from the concert really late, not to mention a couple of us were still heavily intoxicated from drinking at the concert, so he didn't mention much about it that night, but he was quick to tell us the next morning. At this point we thought, okay, these people were part of some weird church, whatever, it's fine. That explains some of the weird rules and books we had found. We left for the day to go hang out around the city, and when we got back to rest, my friend and partner started doing some more reading on the group. This is when they found out that we were actually staying in one of the prominent leaders' houses. We figured this out by cross-referencing the names of our hosts with the names of the important members of the IHPU, the International House of Prayer University website. After this, we started to snoop a little more in our suite. We found large barrels of dried food, a jug of some liquid that we later found out is what they drink while they fast, and lots more IHOPKC teaching materials. Basically, it seemed like they were completely prepared for some sort of end times rapture. Eventually, we did go back and read more thoroughly through the reviews and found a few that would have set off some serious red flags. For example, one review stated how the male owner brought out a gun in front of the people who were staying there. And yikes, not to mention... If there was even a hint of a negative review left, the host would leave a snarky reply. Needless to say, we spent as much of our time as possible away from the Airbnb as we could for the remainder of our trip, and although we were never in any direct danger, we did feel very uncomfortable with the whole thing. When I was about 9 years old, this would have been in the early 90s, my family and I lived in a house with a fairly big wooded area behind our backyard. I say fairly big because it wasn't big enough that you could really get lost in it for very long, but it was big enough that you could walk into it for a good 20 minutes before making it to the center. It got pretty thick in some areas and you couldn't see any of the houses from the neighborhoods once inside. 
To my friends and I, it was a magical world. We played in those woods all summer long. My mom would let us go in there as long as we were back by sundown. Like I said, this was the early 90s and times were a little different back then. My best friend would come over and we would run out there and play for hours. We played hide and seek, army, Star Wars, and anything we could think of. But our very favorite thing to do was climb trees. We had a favorite tree to climb. It was a huge pine out towards the middle of the woods. The branches at the bottom were low enough that you could grab and pull ourselves up. And branches leading up there are all very strong and we could climb very high and see a view from above most of the other trees. Sometimes when I got bored at home, I'd go out there by myself. I'd climb real high in that tree and just think about stuff. I loved being way up there. It was so peaceful and calm. One Sunday, I decided to go out on a solo mission in the evening. I knew I didn't have too long before dark, so I hurried into the woods to get a good climb in. I was up in my spot in no time. I remember it was late summer and the weather was still warm late into the evening. I wanted to be able to see a little bit of sunset and then I'd climb down and hurry home. I just sat up there and daydreamed as I waited for the sun to begin to set. Then I heard a twig snap on the ground and I looked straight down and I saw a man standing at the base of the tree looking up at me. I remember he was wearing a filthy brown jacket and he had a patchy beard. His hair was sticking up at random places, looking like he had been relentlessly running his fingers through it. He was just staring at me with a bizarre expression that seemed to be one of wonder and delight. It was an extremely unnerving look, almost the look of someone that just realized that they stumbled across the gold of the end of the rainbow, and that's the only way I can describe it. It made my blood run cold. I went completely numb, like ice had just been injected into my veins. I don't know how long he had been watching me before I noticed him, and thinking about that still makes me shiver. We just stared at each other for a moment. He didn't say anything, and neither did I. It sounds strange, but I didn't want to scream or tell him to go away because I had this feeling that told me not to provoke him in any way. After a few minutes, he spoke. You coming down anytime soon? I shook my head back and forth. I didn't know what to say to him. It was clear I was very uncomfortable at this point and that should be enough to make a decent person go away, but he only grinned at me. Then he reached his hand up and grabbed the bottom branch of the tree as if to test to see if it could hold him. I do believe he may have been planning to climb up to me, but the lowest branch was flimsy and it was not strong enough to hold a grown adult. I thank God for that. He soon realized this and gave up, but... I had seen enough. I finally broke my silence and started to yell for someone to help me. I kept screaming and screaming. The man backed away a step or two from the tree and began to mumble and curse under his breath. He flailed his arms in the air in a rage and began making a motion like he was pushing an invisible person in front of him. Eventually he turned and walked away, sort of stumbling with each step. I don't think anybody heard my cries because nobody came to help me. I stayed up in that tree for what felt like hours because I wasn't sure if he was really gone. Finally, I climbed down because the sun was beginning to set and I couldn't bear to be out there at night. I hit the ground and bolted back to my house, positive that he would pop out from a shadow and grab me. He never did. I made it home and told my parents. My dad went out to look in the woods, but he never saw anybody. We stayed in that house for about another two years before we moved across town to a larger house. I never played in those woods again for the rest of our time there. I still think about that man sometimes. What would he have done if I would have came down? I have no idea. But that question does keep me up some nights. When I was eight, we moved to military housing adjacent to the big base. I was a weird child and spent a lot of time in my tree reading if I wasn't out with the local hooligans playing in boxes like overgrown cats. There was a pomegranate bush in our yard so I would eat one while lounging on a thick branch with an R.L. Stein novel. 
I kept noticing this guy walking back and forth on multiple occasions, but who was I to judge what an adult does? I was home alone one day, so I stayed in my backyard while reading in the shade of an overgrown bush, but still visible to a passerby. That same guy was looking around our backyard that faced the tennis courts and open desert wilderness. He starts casually trying to lift the gate hatch, so I ran inside and locked the doors. I told my parents later on and they listened but thought I was being dramatic. About a week later, I was at my friend's house with three other girls. We were in bathing suits playing in hose water in a mini pool trying to find relief from the sweltering heat. My friend's house faced a large park and one of them noticed this guy watching us. Someone went in to tell their parents but the guy must have noticed all of us going from wild animals to a small circle with little animation. My friend's mother was from Korea and ran out with a wooden spoon yelling and raging in Korean. She chased after the already retreating lurker but gave up, locked us inside and called the base police. I told them about the lurker but I couldn't be sure if it was the same one. The mother noticed he had a camera with him, it was back in the 90s. We ate Keebler cookies, vanilla with fudge in the middle while her mother sobbed to the police. Human trafficking is a more tangible fear for some than others. Base police called my parents and they finally took me seriously. The house was searched which I thought was just normal protocol. I was heavily monitored by them and not able to do much without my mother in arm's reach. One day about a week or so later we were eating lunch at a fast food place and I recognized the guy. I tell my dad and he asked me if I was sure and when I confirmed he lunged at the guy and threw him back in his chair. The base cops came and looked through his camera to find pictures of me with my friends and at recess. He was arrested immediately. The weirdest part about it, he had broken into our house and made some rat's nest, I assume, of my things in his home. They found everything from baby pictures to clothing. The worst part about it? No charges because my dad was about to retire and get a big job in Michigan. He was also high ranking which probably had nothing to do with it. When talking to my mom about it years later, she told me he had accessed our attic and cut through the AC vent to watch me through it. That would also explain why my room was always hot but now I wonder if she is the one being dramatic. About eight years ago, two buddies and I decided to spend the night camping at Palo Duro Canyon. We're from Amarillo, Texas, so it's less than 20 miles away. This is the second largest canyon in the US next to the Grand Canyon. And while you may be wondering what kind of spooky stuff we may have run into as young kids of just 17 years of age, this isn't necessarily that kind of story. Instead, us three friends were some of the only around our age that we knew that didn't indulge in partying. No drinking, getting stoned, nothing of that nature. So, of course we think a perfect getaway on a Friday night would be the canyon. We didn't even own camping supplies. We just went to Walmart and bought some and headed out on a whim. We make the drive and get to the state park at around 5pm. We entered the gate and set off to find a spot to pitch a few tents. We pull into the campsite area that has two separate canopies with picnic tables and respective grills for cooking. In the middle of both canopies, a fire pit. Nobody was there so we thought it was the perfect place to set up camp. We bought some coolers with soda, some hot dogs and hamburgers to grill, and a stereo to jam some tunes while we hung out and enjoyed the last few hours of daylight in the Texas summer heat. After we pitched our tents, a truck with a small camper RV moseyed down to our site. A man and a woman get out and surveyed the area. The man saw us and waved with that friendly Texan hospitality. We waved back of course and went about our business. We ate dinner and the sun was starting to set. I noticed that the man and woman didn't pitch a tent and that they probably just intended on staying in their camper. We built a fire and sat around it in some portable chairs we brought and saw the man walking towards us. He introduced himself as Doug and said that he cooked a lot of extra food if we wanted any. We politely declined and told him that we already ate but we appreciated the offer. He said, hey, 
As long as you guys have eaten, it's no big deal. He waved again and set back off to his camp. About an hour later, he comes back with a brown paper bag and comments on the music we were listening to. Says how back in the 70s, he went to all these festivals and basically just rambles on how it's awesome that we're so young and still keeping classic rock alive. He notices that my friends have guitars and actually yells over to his wife to come on over. By this point, we don't think anything weird of it, we just didn't know him or his wife and he was obviously drinking and just invited themselves into our space. None of us have the spine to say anything to him about it, so we all just sat around the fire trading stories as much as three 17-year-old boys can with a couple probably in their late 50s, early 60s. After what seemed like a lifetime of nonsensical stories with these people we don't know, he starts trying to get to know us on a more personal level. Super polite, but obviously a little drunk. Asks us if we have jobs or if we're in school and we all reply. He says that he works at a United supermarket as a stalker and has for the last 15 years. Basically says that if any of us need a job at any time, then we can put him as a reference and he can get us on. He says his full name for us to reference just in case any one of us wants to apply. This is important for later. Anyways, finally the wife starts nodding off. All liquored and bundled up, she fell asleep in her chair. Luckily, that was the cue for Doug to get her back to the camp and put her to bed. When they walk back to their site, the three of us look at each other and eye roll because we are all such doormats and basically let this stranger come ruin our night. We see that it's close to midnight, so we decide to put out the fire and get ready for bed. Doug trots back over to our site. He asks us if we're here all weekend or not. We told him we only had enough money to stay for the one night and that we'd be heading back to town in the morning. He said he really enjoyed the company and that he'd personally pay for us to stay another night if he wanted. We politely declined his offer and he started back to his RV. He quickly turns back around and says, Remember guys, if any of you need a job, just call up the United on Gem Lake Road and tell them Doug sent you. We smiled and said thanks and he left for good that time. That night actually got considerably cold and we decided to pack up and head back to our warm beds in town at around 4am. As we were leaving the canyon, we almost hit a deer and veered off the road. Everyone was okay, but we were definitely shocked because it was so late and we had gotten no sleep at that point. Us almost hitting the deer was practically the climax of our trip to the canyon that weekend and we all continued back to school on Monday like normal. One of my friends that was with me on the camping trip was actually in my third period class on Monday and we started talking about how that guy Doug and his wife were pretty cool despite not taking the hint that we didn't care to hang out with them. I asked my buddy if he could remember Doug's last name and somehow he did so I googled him. Mistake. Guess who was a 10 times over registered offender, who almost all of his victims were boys from the ages of 12 to 17? You guessed it, good old Doug. This rocked our world. We had somehow, some way just barely escaped the clutches of this absolute freak. What would have happened to us if we took his offer to stay another night? I was super suspicious of this dude and couldn't get the scenario off my mind that I decided to call United Supermarket to tell the manager that one of his employees was being really creepy to us kids and that he might want to be wary of the people he hires. And guess what? Nobody by the name Doug had ever worked for United. He made up all those stories all night long, trying to get us drunk to do God knows what to us innocent kids. I was a senior going to a pretty well-respected community college near my hometown. One of my classes was an intensive public speaking course with a professor that I adored. At the start of the semester in this class, nothing was out of the ordinary. My classmates and I either all got along or kept to ourselves. We were adults after all. This was my last class of the day so I would often have up to an hour to kill beforehand and would always look for quiet, comfy nooks to either study, work on assignments, or watch YouTube. 
One day, I was working on a paper in a nook near my public speaking class when I noticed this guy from said class standing at the entrance to the little lobby, staring at me. I just ignored it because I was busy. He walked over and stood above me, staring until I acknowledged him with a hi. He proceeded to take a seat near me and start asking me really mundane questions about the weather in our class. I humored him but eventually said that I was trying to work on a paper and would like to be left alone. He just went silent and sat, watching me until it was time for our class. He walked with me, despite me not making eye contact or engaging with him in any way. Our classroom was set up in a way where each row had one solid desk on a big step, each one higher than the one in front, like stairs. This guy sat below me, so when I noticed he had turned around in his seat to stare at me, a lot of other people did too. It was very obvious. I chose to ignore this behavior at first, but I started to notice him everywhere. The campus wasn't huge, but it certainly had enough tiny study spaces and nooks that a person could easily hide away from others. That was the whole point of the study nooks. Still, he would always be around, no matter where I went, watching me. The incident that first made me report him was on a presentation day for our class. He found me in a computer lab where I sat with a couple of friends, but was unfortunately not sitting between any of them. So this guy, who I'll call Noah for now, walked up next to me, making sure his crotch was close to my face, and asked if I'm ready to give my speech. I said yes, and I'm trying to work on last-minute changes to the outline. He then pulled a leather belt out of his backpack and, scooting a tad closer to me, started putting his belt on, saying, Look, I got a new belt for the speech. When I just nodded and went back to working on my outline, he said, Watch this, and scooted so close my ear brushed his pants when I turned my head. I was mortified and instinctively scooted my chair away, which made my friends look over at what was going on. One of them asked me what was up, and I told them nothing. Noah eventually walked away after getting his belt on, and then I told everyone what happened. My friend Nicole told me to report him after I explained his other behavior. After class that day, I did. I went to the student advocates and told her everything that happened, that it was uncomfortable, and asked what I could do. She told me, You know, I think he may be on the spectrum or just socially awkward. Have you tried getting to know him? I told her I didn't want to get to know him and that I shouldn't have to befriend people who make me uncomfortable even if they are on the spectrum or socially awkward. She said she would take what I said into consideration and only come back if he did anything actually worth reporting, since sticking your junk in someone's face is apparently not any form of harassment. So, Noah kept following me, appearing wherever I was. Sometimes he would try to talk to me, sometimes he would just watch me. He followed me through the parking lot to my car one time. He stared at me in class. He tried talking to people he knew were my friends to try to get involved in conversations with me when they were hanging out with me. After class one day, I decided to go to the McDonald's near campus to grab dinner on my way home for the day. I decided to go inside because I used to have a thing about drive throughs for some reason. As I was waiting for my food, the girl who took my order came to the counter and called me over. She asked, Do you know that guy? I turned to my right and... Noah had pulled his car up next to the glass wall, where the drive through line was supposed to be, except there are no cars in front of him and he's 50 feet behind the menu and speaker, staring at me. As soon as I made eye contact with him, he backed his car up and began pulling into the parking space to the left of my car. My stomach dropped. Now he had followed me off of campus. My face must have went pale because the girl looked concerned and I told her exactly what was happening that Noah was stalking me on campus and now he was here. This girl, honestly, my hero, said, Okay, I'm gonna rush your order. If you feel unsafe and he starts heading in here, I'll hide you in the back and call the police. Just as she got my food to the counter, Noah got out of his car and started walking towards the entrance. I told the girl that I was going to put my head down and rush past him, get in my car and get out of here. She told me to be safe. I walked with purpose out of the McDonald's, walking straight past Noah. 
He started trying to talk to me and follow me in my car, so I ran, got in, locked the doors, and pulled out. I looked in my mirrors the entire way home, scanning, scared I'd seen his car behind me. Luckily, he didn't follow me home. The next day, I told my friend Nicole what happened and that I wasn't sure if I could report it because of what the student advocate had said. She was appalled and said she would go with me to report. We sat down and I told the student advocate everything that had happened since the last time I reported. Her response was that I was overreacting and that she would document my report but wouldn't grant me a campus restraining order against him. She left me with, if he does something to you, touches you, hurts you, then we can investigate and get the police involved for a restraining order. Nicole and I were angry and I felt so defeated. We went to talk to our mutual friend Amanda about it and found that he was being creepy to her as well, to the point that he had followed her to her car and wouldn't let her leave until she talked to him. I guess when he wasn't following me around and he was following her. She said she hadn't reported it because she didn't think anyone would take her seriously. She also said another friend of hers was stalked by him for a few months the previous semester to the point her friend had dropped the class that they had together to throw off his knowledge of her schedule because the student advocate wouldn't help her either. The next day all three of us, Nicole, Amanda, and I, went to the student advocate to show he was doing this to more than one person and he had actually kept Amanda from leaving. The student advocate finally decided to start an investigation. Unfortunately, all of us were graduating soon by that point and never saw the outcome of the investigation. I did try to talk to campus police first. The officer I spoke to told me that the process for my type of situation was to talk to the student advocate first who would then determine if it was worth filing a report and taking action. And the investigation involved the student advocate talking to Noah and my professor to Noah himself and it didn't involve any police whatsoever. Though at the end of the day, I wish it had. A cop car was following me but didn't turn on their lights. I noticed they started following me before I even left my neighborhood so I'm not sure if they started from my house or not. They followed me for four miles before I turned onto another street to see if they were actually following me or going straight. They followed again. Then I turned into a gas station and guess who parked next to me? Well, I went inside and pretended to shop and they came inside too and just watched me. Didn't even buy anything. They were a heavy set man who looked to be about 40 to 45 and was completely bald. He was Caucasian but had a fisherman's type tan so he kind of looked reddish. He wasn't in uniform but had a badge hanging from his pocket. His pants were unzipped and he looked sweaty. I'm a young woman and I was alone. I left the store and sat in my car. He did the same. Then I went and pumped gas and he did the exact same and I noticed he didn't even actually pump the gas. He just held the nozzle against his car while looking at me. Then I drove again for another three miles to another store. They followed me again into the store and watched me. After ten minutes I left and started the drive. I ended up getting onto a highway that leads to my parents' house about 45 minutes away. They lived in another town and for some reason I just assumed cops on duty would stick to their assigned territory. Of course, I didn't think about how a man creepily following me around town would probably bend the rules of the job. I didn't even know if my assumptions were true. After about 20 more minutes of driving, he finally stopped following me. And I really want to know what he was doing and why. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. I release new videos every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r slash letsreadofficial, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations and bonus content over on Patreon, or click that big join button to hear about the extra perks offered for the channel. And check out the Let's Read podcast where you can hear all of these stories and big compilations and save huge on data. Located anywhere you listen to podcasts. Links in the description below. Thanks so much, friends. And remember, 
The earth is a cream-filled donut.